a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. A reading from the New Testament book, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head, of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Here end the readings, and thanks be to God. I'd like to share with you a story the title I have is The Guru's Cat, G-U-R-U. Uh, guru being someone who has received a truth and understood it, or an insight, or perhaps a revelation, and is willing in some ways to share it, although good gurus never tell you what they know. They simply point you in that direction so that you can discover it for yourself. But anyway, that, that's getting us already off topic. Um, this guru had a cat. And when he and his disciples got together to worship, the cat would come in and distract people. It's very hard to go into deep meditation when you have a cat scratching on your leg, say. So... The guru tied up his cat during, during worship. And that solved the problem for a time. But then the guru died. But his disciples continued to bring the cat into worship and tie it up. And after a while, the cat died. And guess what? The disciples now, who were completely disconnected from the guru, Except by a generation or two. Well, we've always had a cat tied up in worship, so we better go buy a cat and tie it up during worship. And this went on for centuries. 
And so far, it's relatively harmless. But after a while, these gurus, godly disciples, begin to write treatises on the liturgical significance of tying up a cat during worship. And then they went on, and it got worse. What kind of cat should it be? What kind of tether should we use? And what do we do with the cat when we're not in worship? And on and on and on and on, so that the guru's teaching is completely forgotten. Because people are trying to figure out what to do with the cat. And I might add that little of what we do, maybe nothing of what we do in most worship today was on Jesus' radar when he was teaching. But our local seminary brags that it has the largest library in the tri-state area, containing, I think at last count, 350,000 theological treatises. Anyway. I want to step up into current times. Michael Pollan, anybody know or follow Michael Pollan on any of the media? He's considered one of the 100 most influential persons in America right now. We would call him an influencer. He's about 60, I think, like you, Doug. <laughs> Middle age, right? Uh, he's a writer, primarily. He's written a lot about food. And one statement that you'll see out there again is when asked how we should eat, a question that all of us think about, I think. He says very simply, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Okay. That's why this morning I had ham and eggs for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have a different belief. I think that plants are what food eats. But Michael Pollan also writes about drugs. In particular, psychedelic drugs. Uh, his last two books, I think. I know one, and he just released another one. Uh, this is your mind on plants, meaning psilocybin, uh, DMAO, DMT, and so on. Oh, and of course, LSD. Part of it's history, part of it is what's going on in the world today. Uh, a lot of stuff coming out of Silicon Valley is due to microdosing with these psychedelics. Again, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, but he claims they are life-changing. And I think they are for many people. They begin to see reality and consciousness in new ways. But it also seems to me that if we use drugs to alter our brain chemistry, we're not really getting in touch with reality. We're getting in touch with some distorted vision, that we're not seeing the truth. These two ideas that belief systems form up, and we all have a belief system. And that outside of that belief system, an event can happen to us that is life-changing, or what is driving my thought in this sermon, and what is driving Paul's thought. We all have a belief system. There's a way we live in the world. Whether it be that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, or that poverty is the greatest uh, way to live our lives, doesn't matter. We all have a belief system we live with. And sometimes something happens to us that dramatically changes that. That's, that's basically what Paul is saying here today. We have a belief system that we, in some sense, inherit, inherit. 
We get it from our parents. They teach us certain things, perhaps directly, perhaps indirectly by their lifestyle, or even negatively. This is what I don't want to be when I grow up. We get it from our friends. We learn from their successes and their mistakes. We get it from our culture. We get pictures of how to live from influencers. We get it from the media. We get it from our life experience. And we seldom, if ever, challenge this belief system. It's so much a part of us that we don't think about it. We don't sit down and say, gee, why do I believe this? Very, very seldom do we do that. And we live in a culture that barely believes in God, but believes in ghosts and UFOs and Bigfoot and TikTok and on and on and on and on. And so few people, very few people, draw their belief system from the Bible. There's a ton of research out there now. Uh, tens of thousands of people surveyed in churches about their belief systems, and very, very little of what they believe actually comes from Scripture. They do not have a biblical worldview. So we base our life on this belief system, what we do, what we don't do, what we eat, what we don't eat. You can prove to me forever that plant-based is better, and I'll still eat ham and eggs for breakfast. Okay. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Uh, but we're very much like Adam and Eve, constantly reaching for that forbidden fruit, and we never challenge it. We never, we never challenge our belief system. And it was no different in Colossae until, and this is the setting for Paul's argument, until the Colossians, by God's grace, hear the gospel. They hear a new message that is completely different from anything they've been told before. <coughs> so Paul begins, he says, You received Jesus Christ. We have to be careful how we unpack this. You received Jesus Christ. He did not come in a package that had the prime logo on it. Okay. That would be a hyper-literal explanation of this. What the Colossians received was a tradition or a teaching about Jesus that began the apostles. <coughs> this is who Jesus is. This is how he lived his life. This is how he died. And amazingly, God raised him from the dead. The reception is of a, again, a tradition or a teaching about Jesus that they realized was true. This man, Jesus, really had been born of the Virgin Mary. He really had lived and performed these miracles. He really did die. He really was raised by God. And they knew this deep within them. They had in that almost mystical sense, received Christ. These teachings had changed the way they saw the world. It changed the way they related to the world then and the way they related to other people in the world.
They accepted this as a divine teaching brought to them by Paul, and it was radically life-changing for them. Ever try to change a habit? Were you successful? I don't see anybody shaking their head yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> a hard to change, aren't they? Even when we want to. As I said, even if you can prove to me that plant-based is better, I'm going to eat ham and eggs. And I'm planning on a steak for lunch. <laughs> Habits are hard to change. Lifestyles are hard to change. Belief systems are extremely hard to change. Now, that means that the Colossians, and that means that you and I, are and always will be highly impacted by the belief system in which we grew up. The second piece Paul tries to tell them when he says that they have essentially in Christ, in this new belief, conquered the elemental spirits of the world is hard for us to understand as well. Ancient peoples, almost all ancient peoples, and, and many modern ones believed, one, that they lived in the world populated by invisible demons. And that these demons would do them harm. The only way to not be harmed was either to make the demons happy somehow, much of the pagan religion did this, or to worship a god who could keep the demons under control. Paul is telling them that in this new belief system, this old belief system is irrelevant, inconsequential, and of no effect. That in Christ, a completely new life has begun. They are not under the power of their culture, or their belief system, or the demons. It's that new and that powerful. It has completely moved them into a new way of life. That puts them at odds with their families, with their culture, with the government, with almost everything that exists. Perhaps not as dramatically, or maybe more dramatically, because our belief systems are just as strong. Coming into the Christian faith puts us at odds with our old belief systems and our culture. Christianity is that different. It calls us to live in obedience to God. It calls us to a completely new and different and challenging moral structure. And it calls us to live out on the edge in faith. Paul uses the example that now the Colossians are at odds with their Greek culture and their demonic world. And kind of as a side, I think we'd be surprised at how much we're influenced by Greek culture. It saturates our thought. And while we no longer believe in demons, we do have the memes of our influencers, TikTok, Facebook, and so on, driving us, from which we have to step away. Oh. And I, I think we can take at face value <coughs> Paul's claims that for us, all this has been conquered in Christ. All of it.
So I'm going to suggest this morning that you examine your belief system. And this is true if you're Christian, it's true if you're Islamic or Jewish, or even it's true if you're atheist. What do you really, really believe on? What do you base the decisions that drive what you do every day? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you think the thoughts you think? Why do you work where you work? Why do you relate to people the way you relate to people? What is it that really, really drives you? What calls you forward? It's not easy to do that, to figure out what you really, really believe. Do you really believe that Jesus' life and death works for you in every situation? That it's on his death and resurrection that you should base every single decision that you make. Do you really believe that? Do I really believe that? I have to ask myself as well. What, what, what really drives us? I guess another way to ask the question is, how many cats do I have tied up that need to be set free? Let's pray. Holy God, Give us that grace that sets us free in Christ to live the life to which you call us. Amen. Again, if you are able and comfortable, please stand and we'll sing Standing on the Promises, another of the great old hymns.
And let us pray. Now God, having received and heard your word, let it sink deeply into us. That as you changed the lives of disciples long ago, as you changed the lives of men and women at Colossae and Galatia and Ephesus, and at thousands and thousands and thousands of times and places throughout the world, let the same change come to us. By your grace, renew us so that we turn from old ways to new ways, from ways that lead away from you to ways that lead to you, that call us to obedience, obedience that leads to new life, fresh new lives lived in your presence as witnesses to the world and witnesses to ourselves. Holy God, from before the world you chose us and loved us. And now your call, your effective call, comes to us. So let us listen, and let us respond, and let us be changed and renewed so that we are yours and the world knows that we are yours. Draw us together as one church, one head, Jesus Christ, one Lord, Jesus Christ. And then send us back out into this world so that your will be done through all creation. We ask, O oh Lord, that you guide the leaders of our churches Change and guide the leaders of our world. Renew us and strengthen us. And let us live into your glory. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.